How many people here would love to go on a vacation this Thanksgiving? Rather than just being home with family. I mean, being home with family is great. But what if you had Thanksgiving somewhere like this? Say amen if someone wants to do this. Amen. That you want to pray to God right now that you want to go here. That God will just sends you, you know, money or tickets so you can go here. And everybody understands that every time um, I go on vacations, every single person, I, I mean, at least like eight people text me and go, can you take me with, can you take me with you? I'm like, well, if I took you, you wouldn't be a vacation, right? But, but they go, uh, put, they say weird things like, uh, can you put me in your suitcase? I'm like, really? I mean, I will, but a lot of people, when they evaluate what they get for suffering, they think that going in a suitcase might be worth it, right? You go in there for those eight, I mean, you might be dead, by the way, by the time you come out. But they think if you, I, I will suffer for, you know, eight days in the sun. And those umbrella drinks. I mean, if, I will suffer eight hours for that because I know what I get in the end. And, and I remember one time our family was going to Puerto Rico. And um, <clears throat> JetBlue, don't, don't fly JetBlue, people. Um, they really make it hard for you if you're late. Well, we're always late <laughs> to everything. So we get there, and then we're already late, and then... Um, my mother-in-law, which is, you know, Pastor Lydia's mom, is on a no-fly list. Somehow her name is Kim, Su you know, Kim Young-suk, and that's also a name of a terrorist in North Korea. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so she's going through the airport, airport security, and they say, uh, ma'am, come with us. And she's like, oh, scared. And it turns out, basically, that, you know, her name is identical with the terrorists in North Korea. And they're not allowed to fly to the U you know, USA. And so we're, we're already delayed, and, and there we are. We're trying to make the plane. And, you know, like, if you're, like, a delinquent in the airport, like our family is, um, they usually call your name. Kim family. <laughs> you know? Please come the way of the terminal. We are leaving without you in five seconds. And so we're all running, and, and some people make it. And there, there's Stephanie, Chummy, and I, the last ones, cleared through security. And so you know how fast I am. You know I'm going to make I mean, come on. It's, it's just kill yourself to make this plane. Because if, if we didn't catch this plane, we would not be able to go until tomorrow. And so what do you do? you got to what? you got to grind it out. So what, what I did was I said, Chummy, give me your bag. And she says, okay. And she's running with her boots or whatever. And she is going so slow. I'm just like, you're a tiny girl. Let's go. And she's like, I'm going fast as I can. You know? And I'm just like, you're not fast enough. So I take her back, put it on my, and I start running faster. And then I start basically swinging her and then catching up to her and swinging her again. And this happens like, you know, seven to eight times. And then we make the plane. Give me... Give me an applause. Come on. Oh, my gosh. I mean, seriously, praise the Lord. We make it. And she's like, thank you. I'm like, you're going to owe me big. But he, he, here is the concept that a lot of us are familiar with. You, you suffer for a clear vision of pleasure. That's tangible for us. That's clear to us. Because it's instant. It's rewarding. You, what you put in is what you get. Uh, the problem is, a lot of times in, in the Christian life, when you go through suffering or trials of many kinds, the Christian life gets blurred a little bit. There's nothing like suffering to start that brings the fire of examination. And, and basically, this series we're on, Back to School, and we want to talk about the law of evaluation. When you suffer, you evaluate everything. I know, I know when, when I was much younger in college, when people used to go out on dates and start dating for two months and then three months and they would break up, and the guy was, would be in love with this girl, and then three months later, he'd be like, she's crazy. I'm like, what happened? I am going through so much suffering. I'm like, why? I'm on the phone 24 hours a day. I'm like, what's, what's wrong with that? I said, you love her. No, -uh, she's And this, this is the common word guys like to use. She's crazy. She's, why? Because she makes me do this, that, and, and, you know, he goes, and the question he's asking me is, 
Sam, is this worth it? Is this suffering worth it? Well, that's the question every man has to ask before they get married. Do I want to be happy or do I want to be miserable but with my love of my life? But, but the question is, is it worth it? Is this valuation correct? And but here's the thing. A lot of times from a lot of conversations, a lot of people that are Christians or, or just beginning to be believers, you go through a hard time in your life, you go through suffering, and there's nothing like it to start examining. What is the point? Is this living for Christ? Or what is this all about for me? Because it really examines the motivation of why you choose to follow Jesus, why you choose to believe in Christianity. It makes you examine it to the core. Because the question anyone asks when they're in suffering is the question, is it worth it? What is in the end of the tunnel for me? What's there? And this book, Hebrews, is the perfect book for our church and the perfect um, example because it's the first book in the New Testament where a second generation author is writing to people that never saw Jesus. You see, the first generation of believers were the patriarchs, the apostles, the 500 witnesses and their families. They saw Jesus. They heard about Jesus and the proximity between his death and resurrection and his life was very close. So they heard the power, they heard the testimony, and they were very close to the eyewitnesses of Jesus. So they were very, very convinced and tangible. They had a, their faith was very tangible in a person of Jesus. Now, for the second generation, the kids and the people who recently came to faith, remember, in this, in this context of this passage, people are being persecuted. They're being killed to be a Christian by Domitian, especially in the Roman Empire. So being a Christian has a lot of connotation and a lot of suffering, but they never saw Jesus. So that gap blurs their Christian life. And the question they were asking, as the author of Hebrews writes to them, the second generation of believers, like many of us in this room, is, is it worth it? I know you're discouraged. I know you're going through a hard time, but let me bring you back to help us evaluate what this is all about. And today, I want to basically answer the question of of how suffering helps us identify the cracks within our own soul and within our own faith. There's nothing like suffering, the fire of suffering, to help you see why you believe, why you do what you do, than hard times. So I want, if you are going through suffering in your life, tell someone, if you're suffering, tell someone, right next to you, if you're suffering, that's a good thing. (laughs) You go, really? It doesn't feel like it. Well, what what suffering feels good? It doesn't. But it does help you see and bring a certain clarity to your faith and helps you really see why you believe. And I think that's very important to reevaluate why you believe or why you might want to believe and test it, right? So let's go down here to this passage. Remember, first of all, the book of Hebrews, we don't know who wrote the book. We just know that whoever wrote it was a genius. (laughs) Um, When they were putting this in the canon of the Bible and then choosing the letters, you know, some people think it's Paul, but most likely it's not because Paul is dead by now. And this person who is writing, literally, is writing to a new church. of People who are suffering and for being persecuted and going through a tough time. And and so he says, as he argues, and this is chapter 12, so for the first 11 chapters, he's been showing people that, yes, I know you're going through, you're discouraged, and it looks bleak right now. It looks like Domitian, and, and the Roman Empire is just, obliterating Christianity from the face of the earth. It looks like your mothers and your brothers and your sisters are being torched by fire, being eaten by lions in Colosseums. And it's scary, isn't it? But I want you to know that you are not the first generation to suffer for the cause of God. Generations before you, 4,000 years of slavery, of captivity, of victory, over, over, perpetually again, men of faith and women of faith, throughout history, have faith, have this same faith as you do. 
And he was weaving the story about Jesus and how the culmination of the gospel really is the person of Christ. And he was showing them, reminding them what this is all about. And that's why in verse 1 of chapter 12, the author says what? Read it with me, the first word. Okay, not one person, everyone. Okay, what does it say? Therefore. Tell someone, therefore. Men never use that in an argument with a woman. It doesn't go well. Because you're, you're making a list and you're saying, bam, therefore. Make, make an argument after an assertion. Don't, never do that. But in this letter, you can because Paul is showing everyone of, of his audience. Here, he goes, here's a list of all the people who suffered for the sake of the cause of God. Here's a list of all the people that knew and saw it very clearly that it was worth it. There are people that did not give up because they saw something that you are missing today. And he's only writing this letter because a lot of people are, give, are tempted to give up. And this is what he says, Therefore, since we are what? Surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. And he names Moses and Abraham and Isaiah and many other of the patriarchs and the prophets. And how they endured and how they saw the power of God in their generation. And he says, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us what? Run with perseverance. The race marked out for us. And I want to pay attention here to verse 3 when he says the word consider. So think upon, reflect. Consider him who endured such what? Opposition from sinful men, so that you will not go weary and lose heart. Like I said, suffering has a way of bringing the fire of motive to people, in relationships, in causes, even in faith. He goes, I'm telling you this, I'm showing you Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. I want you to look at him as an example of why he ran this race. Now, it's important to understand that the author equates the Christian life to what? The Christian, what's the analogy? The, he equates the Christian life to what? A what? A race. A marathon. How many people want to run a marathon? There are some crazy people that do it. 24 miles. I'm just like, you got, nothing, you got nothing better to do? I, I want to be in shape. That's great. I'd rather go to McDonald's. <laughs> and you're like, well, that's a matter of preference. No, but, I mean, running a marathon is all about, I mean, you can't, I mean, it doesn't matter what shape you're in. It doesn't matter how arrogant you are. It doesn't matter if you have eight packs. All right? You don't just run a marathon. If you think you can, you'll, you'll basically burn out by the fifth mile. All right? You go, oh, I could run a marathon. I don't have to train for it. Those are the dumb people that basically, you know where the ambulances, why they have ambulances in the marathon? That's for the dumb people. Oh, I'll just run a marathon. I'm in great shape. I eat at Whole Foods. Ooh. You eat, I eat organic. I have no toxins in my body. I mean, you, anyone that wants a marathon, a full one, you have to train for it. Why? Because the race is not about how much skill you have, how many packs you have. How healthy you think, how mentally, I mean, fit you, it doesn't, it's, it's all about physical training. And you have to prepare yourself for it. Now, a lot of people in the second generation of believers in this text, they forgot what the Christian life is supposed to be. You see, the first generation understood quite well because people were dying, Jesus died and rose again, they were persecuted. You see, a lot of people that come to believe in Jesus, and a lot of us, you come to believe in Christianity, you go, well, yeah, it's logical. Yeah, God answered my prayer. Yeah, that's great. And then you come to Christianity, and then you start suffering. And then you go, oh, what is this all about? How many people think that? Oh, yeah. Man, I thought this was, you know? And you go, you go what, did, what did I think Christianity was? And you go, uh, and, and, you ha and you don't know, you can't articulate it. But a lot of times, suffering helps you identify your assumption. Because the author here says a race. And a race is not a vacation. Right? I, I told you, I'd rather go to Cancun 
if, if, what if, you know, the author says, hey, guys, Jesus marked out a trip for you to Cancun. First class. I mean, that would be easy. But a lot of people assume that the Christian life is a vacation. Because when it gets hard, what, what do you do? You know what, you know what I do when, when it gets hard? Let me just tell you. It got really hard at the airport this weekend. I wanted to choke someone. You know, like in The Simpsons, when Homer like chokes for, I mean, I saw this. We missed our flight because they didn't call our name. And, and this time we weren't running, okay? We were there, okay? We're sitting down. So I just want you to know that. I go, I go to the customer service, and I'm like, I can't believe they didn't call our name. And guess what the person says? I don't really care. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> you don't care? You're empathetic to my problems? Guess what? I don't really care. And then I hear on the loudspeaker someone's announcer of the same flight saying, hey, you left your jacket. Why don't you pick it up? I was like, that would have been convenient. <laughs> saying our name before the flight left, right? This person says, I don't care. I was like, I'm going to choke you. I will kill you. I mean, when things don't go my way, when I suffer, it really shows the motive of my heart, right? Why? Because suffering has a way of doing that. It really does. It shows your motive. Now, here's the question you need to see. When Jesus was suffering on the cross, this text says, and I want everyone to read it with me, verse 2, it says what? Let us what? Fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who what? Who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Now, does it say that Jesus was happy going to the cross? Anyone think Jesus was happy? He was like giddy. Oh, yeah, I'm going to the cross today. I'm going to get nails thrown in my hand. People are going to spit at me. I'm going to love this. No. It says that for the joy set before him. So the question is, what was that joy? Why did Jesus suffer and not lose heart and not give up? In his suffering, you see the motive of his heart. And what was the joy? The joy was us. He didn't die for glory. He didn't die for any other reason but for the love he had for you and me. Tell someone you're messed up, but he loves you. Yeah, but don't don't tell him. I know you like the messed up part. Tell him, but he loves you. (laughs) He loves you. Here's the problem. At the airport, I was, I mean, you know me and my issues with customer service from fast food to airlines. You know me that I just... I I mean, I could have choked her, and then I would be in jail, and then I wouldn't be here. (laughs) You know, and and I could have just went off, and then she wouldn't help me get to another flight. And, you know, and and basically they messed up so bad that when we came to our extension flight in Arizona, they said, oh, we're going to try to make you catch your flight to Newark, okay? And we had to actually get out of the terminal, go back on a shuttle, and go through security again. And you know, if I go to security twice, you know how I feel. But you know what? I didn't lose, lose myself. I didn't go, you know what? And you know, it's, it's really in me to be like, hey, honey, this is Arizona. This place looks like Mars. You ever been to Arizona? It's the coolest thing. Right? It basically looked like Mars. This is where they shot John Carter. I was like, wow. <laughs> this, these, these desert mountain things, well, these are really cool. And I could be like, let's, let's just make a vacation out of this. You know, let's just stay here. Let's eat, eat some, you know, good food, you know, some barbecue. I, I don't know what they have in Arizona, but it looks like Mars. So let's just stay here. No, but I couldn't do that. Why? Because I will suffer to see my five-year-old son. He's on the phone all the time. When are you coming home? Why would you take Josh and not me? <laughs> <laughs> I think about that. I go, I should stay here longer. He's like, why would you take Josh and not me? You know, every single time he calls. But it was worth it when I got home. And when I got home, guess what happened? They lost my luggage. Don't you feel sorry for me? I mean, but they lost my luggage. They got our flights wrong. I mean, it's the worst 
flight experience in history. But you see, I would go through the suffering. I could have gave up and be like, you know what, let's just chill. I can't because of love. You see, what suffering reveals is really real simple. Do you love Jesus or not? Because in suffering, if you want to give up, and you know what? It's, everyone wants to give up when it's hard. Everyone wants to give up on relationships, on friendships, on jobs when it's hard. But what keeps you there has to be love. And if it's not that, and you're grinding out for a vision for why you're suffering for Christ, why you're following God, then you lost sight of why you're doing what you're doing. And then you have to ask this question, right? Let's answer the question, right? Put it up. So how does suffering help us identify the cracks within our faith? Well, first, it examines what? Your motive. So the question then is this. Why am I really in this? Right? I mean, Christian. You're a Christian because you love Jesus. Well, you're supposed to say that. But when you're suffering, it really examines the question, why am I really in this? For Jesus, it was us to save us, to redeem us, to heal us, to be with us. When we suffer, what's the motive? Are we in this for other reasons? I pray the Spirit of God help you see in your suffering the crack within our soul. Because that's what it does. Why am I really in this? What's my motive? God loved me. Jesus loved me on the cross to be with me. But when I suffer, do I really want Jesus? That's a painful examination. But pain helps us grow. That's good. So, okay, let's move down. So that's the first. It it examines our motive. So as you come down here, The writer of Hebrews is addressing, again, the second generation believers. Now, for some of us here, there are many different motives of why we want to follow God. And usually, in the very beginning, why we want to follow God is the other verses in this passage. For example, as we read verse 2 again, it says, um, He endured the cross, right, for the joy said before him, scorning its shame, and what? In that part, read it with me. And sat down at what? At the right hand of God. So there is a glorious part of the gospel. And a lot of people want the glory. How many people here want the glory? How many people want the joy? How many people want the good times? That's why you believe, right? You go, oh, God has a wonderful plan for my life. That's why, I mean, partially the reason you believe is because you're like, well, I think my, my life, it will be better with God, you know? I'll advance, God bless me, you know, I'll be rich, I'll have a better smile, I'll be better looking, you know? It'll be great. And so a lot of people believe in the gospel in the very beginning, oh, yeah, 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 Jesus died for me on the cross, yeah, yeah, it's, it's about blessing, it's about blessing. But here's the problem. What suffering shows is our incentive. What you're in this for. I think Kanye says it well in an old song called Gold Digger. Right? And and he uses irony and play on words. I'm not saying that she's a gold digger, but she is. But she's not messing with any bro. I mean, you know, you know. (laughs) I mean, and I want to just say this, and I want to get rid of this ideological, really embedded, deep root of sin within humanity and our church and our culture and our heart. The truth is, a lot of people believe in God because they're gold diggers. And it shows, right, when you're suffering. It shows when you're not getting what you want, and it shows when you're not advancing like you want, you're not, you, you don't have the life you envisioned for your mind. 
And it shows in the attitude, and it shows in the complaint, and it shows in the heart, and says, you know, God, what's up? I'm, I'm obeying. I'm struggling. I'm fighting. How come there's no blessing? It really shows why we do what we do. Lastly, the second lesson we learn of how suffering helps us identify the cracks within our soul is what? Is it examines your incentive, not just your motive. Is it for love? Incentive, why do I really want? What do I really want from this? What do I want from this? And that's the, that's the part of the tension of the Christian life. I thought that if I believe in God, my life would just be blessing. It would be perfect. Suffering is the only way to show if you really love someone or not. I mean, if you're having a good time all the time, there, there's something wrong with you. Because you're not perfect and I'm not perfect. It reveals the true motive. You know, I've been a believer for a very long time, and this is how I look at the gospel. A lot of people think they lose. And you go, well, is this worth it? Is this worth it? Is following God worth it? Yes, it's worth it. When I came home that night, at midnight, we lost my luggage, delayed our flights. I was not very happy. Oh, yeah, and I also didn't get to eat. And you know how that goes. And as we got off the plane and I went home, my son was sleeping. Nathan was sleeping. And... He woke up, and, he, and first, and I was like scared, you know, because he just wants his mommy sometimes. And I just went through hell, heaven and earth to be here for him. And he wakes up, he goes, oh, mommy. He hugs him, and I'm just like cringe. I'm like, if he says, I don't want you, <laughs> I'm going to have a heart attack. <laughs> I'm just, this is not going to be worth it. Never again. I'm staying in Arizona next time. But he comes down the stairs like a rabbit, hops down, and says, Daddy, I missed you. And he gives me a hug. People, the gospel is not about salvation. The gospel is not about gifts. The gospel is not about prosperity. The gospel is not about all these benefits. The gospel is about you getting God. God's arms around you. I pray today that would be enough. And you would feel God's love. And you would feel the warmth of his embrace today. Will you stand and pray with me? Lift your hands with me to the Lord. Father, we want to come before you now. And... I want to pray, God, that in our suffering, that we would prove our weakness. Yes, Lord, we're weak <coughs> to selfishness. We're weak to the advancement of our own life. We're weak. But, Lord, what kind of people do we really want to be when you scorned shame and you died on the cross and, and went through an excrucible of pain, excruciating pain, and, and humiliation because you, want, you wanted us. You thought of me above all things. And yet, Lord, a lot of us still are inoculated to the fact that when we live our life for me and not for you, that that's okay. I pray that it will hurt us. It, and no one needs to see us hurt. No one needs to know that it hurts us. Because in the end of the day, we're not Christians, God, because we need to be accepted by people, or we want to impress people, or we want to please people, or win people, or fit in. We're, we're Christians in the end, really. Ultimately, we're not going to last if we're not Christians because we love God and God loves us. I pray today that there will be a pain that, that births and conceives in our heart. and really feels Jesus' heart for us. 
and why he died. And come back to that place and be like, God, it's all about you. You're worth it. And that has to be our worship, folks. Above all. So as we spend some time with the Lord this, this afternoon, will you, in your spirit, remember who Jesus is to you. Because that's what this writer is trying to remind the second generation. And you know what? Our church is here today because those people succeeded in discovering who he was. And it changed the world. I pray that we would be reminded of who Jesus is again and we would change our world. Sing with us. worship him of all, of all, all powers. Will you lift your hands with me and just worship Jesus? Be reminded of who he is. Reminded why you're running this race. Reminded who you're running for. Reminded why it's worth it. Reminded that it's not what you gain in the outside, but it's who you gain. Let's declare his glory. Jesus.
rejected and alone like a rose trampled on the ground you took the fall part of me above all like a rose trampled on Father, we come before you this afternoon. I pray, God, when we are crushed like a rose in this life, when we're trampled, when we're suffering, and we're losing heart and discouraged because things don't go our way or because unseen circumstances are turbulent in our life, We pray, Father, that we wouldn't think above all about me and how I need to have a better life and the entitlement we deserve or why God's not giving me what I, what I used to have or a better life because that would be just messed up. But the point of developing to be a full developed follower of Christ is that above all in that suffering is to think of Jesus. That is worship, people. And I pray that our church, and as disciples, and as the community of faith, that will be the testimony and the bedrock of our worship and our love for God. And in our suffering, above all, it will be about Him. And then in the end of the tunnel, people, not only will God be with you in suffering, He will lift you out of it, above it, and use it for His glory. We thank you, Father. In faith we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Stu Still. I'm a small group leader here at 180 Church, and I just want to welcome you all to our Sunday service. Before we get started, we have just a couple of quick announcements, uh, starting with tithes and offering. You know, um, we believe that God really is the source of everything that we have in our lives, whether it's finances, whether it's health, whether it's, you know, good times, whatever it is. He's the source of everything that we have, and he asks us to give back to him in order to help uh, bring the mission, the, the word of God, to other people. So we ask all of our members here to continue to tithe faithfully. You can tithe either in the back at the info booth, or you can tithe online at 180church.tv through PayPal. Or if you have a Chase account, you can also tithe through uh, QuickPay at uh, offering at 180church.tv. Um, and again, if you're, a member, if you're a member here, please remember to tithe faithfully. And if you're a visitor, you know, and you feel like you've been blessed by today's sermon, you know, and you want to make a, uh, an <coughs> offering, please, uh, please feel free to do that as well. Uh, next, we have our uh, prayer hotline. Uh, we have a uh, number where you can text in prayer requests, 5397-PRAYER. You know, sometimes there's things going on in our lives, and we need people to pray for us um, to ask for God's help in the things that are going on. And this is a way where you can ask for other people to pray for you. You know, we pray for these things during small groups, and uh, at other times, you know, we pray for these things. And God really does answer prayer, and a lot of people have felt God answering uh, these prayers already. So if you have something going on, please uh, send us a text. And if you uh, get an answer from God and you have something to praise him for, send the text there as well so that we can all celebrate in what God is doing. Uh, next, we have small groups. Small groups meet uh, weekly here in the city and uh, in Staten Island. They're a place where we can get to know uh, what God is doing in our lives a little bit better. Uh, we can talk about how the word really applies to our lives directly and just get better connected with the, the community as a whole. And if you're not a member of small groups, I want to really encourage you to join one. You can talk to Andrew Park, and uh, he'll get you connected. And if you have any questions about 180 Church, you can also talk to him, and give you, he'll give you all the answers that you need. And uh, lastly, uh, at the bottom of all of our emails, we have a link to uh, invite a friend along the journey in Christ. Uh, you can check it out all the way at the bottom of the emails. Just plug in the uh, email address of a friend that you want to bring along in the journey in Christ, and uh, we'll get them the emails, and we can bring them along as well. You'll be out.